On November 15, 2008, Progress M65, which had been docked since September, undocked from the aft port of Zarya. After a few weeks, it orbited alone, conducting plasma progress experiments, and was finally deorbited on December 8, 2008, and burnt up in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. On November 15, 2008, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched STS-126 to the International Space Station. Three, two, one, booster ignition, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavour, preparing our home in space for a larger international family. Houston now controlling. Houston Endeavour World Program. STS-126 was a resupply and repair mission. It used the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistic Module to ferry equipment to the station. Speed 1,000 miles an hour, altitude one mile, downrange distance six and a half miles from Kennedy Space Center already. down to 72% of the rate of thrust as the shuttle goes through the realm of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Altitude 5 miles, downrange 8 miles from Kennedy Space Center. Speed 1,500 miles an hour. Endeavor, go at throttle up. All systems remain go. Speed 2,000 miles an hour, altitude 10 miles, downrange distance 12 miles from Kennedy Space Center. It's one and a half minutes since launch. Endeavour has consumed more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant and weighs less than half of what it did at launch. Standing by for burnout of the twin solid rocket boosters and jettison. Watching it down at the launch, they said it was really spectacular, and you can kind of see it there in the video. This is an interesting perspective of the solid rocket booster sitting on the solid rocket booster as it separates from the external tank. And the ride, it's amazing. That, that occurs about two minutes into the launch, and it's amazing how the ride really smooths out. And now, as we're continuing up to orbit, the, the Gs are, are continuing to continue. And then we hit what's called main engine cutoff, where all of a sudden you, you, you feel weightless. And here's the separation right after we had that Miko main engine cutoff. And if you look at the back of the orbiter, you'll see a camera that we have installed in the, in the aft section that's going to take some pictures of the tank. After achieving orbit, the crew used the orbital boom sensor system to inspect Endeavour for any damage sustained during launch. Analysis of the imagery noted a small piece of thermal blanket appeared to come loose under the left orbital maneuvering system pod. But that area is not an area of concern, as it does not experience high heat during re-entry. After a shorter than normal rendezvous orbit, Endeavour approached the station. Commander Christopher Ferguson guided the shuttle manually through the rendezvous pitch maneuver, while the station's crew took high-resolution pictures of the shuttle's heat shield for analysis. At 2200 hours Universal Coordinated Time, on November 16, 2008, Endeavour docked with the International Space Station. Capture light. Beautiful. After the two crews exchanged greetings, they performed a safety briefing 
and then set right to work, beginning transfers and preparing for robotic operations. Gregory Chamatov and Sandra Magnus officially switched positions with the swap of their Soyuz seat liners. Chamatov joined the STS-126 crew as a mission specialist, and Magnus officially became Flight Engineer 2 for Expedition 18. We brought up this cargo container, which is passionately referred to by us folks at NASA as the MPLM. And we moved this cargo container from the payload bay of the space shuttle uh, and burst it onto the side of the space station using the Canadian robotic arm. And then we could open up the hatch and start to offload all this, uh, all these go goodies that, that we brought on board uh, in, the, in this cargo container. And some of the goodies included these full-size space station racks, which are about the size of a large upright freezer. And they can weigh upwards of a half a ton. And uh, we, we can move these around uh, just using fingertip pressure and float them into place on the space station. Now we brought up a, a suite of racks which uh, together make up our advanced life support system for space station. And this starts off with a new toilet which uh, goes, which is plumbed into a urine processing rack. And this urine processing rack can make potable water out of, uh, um, well, you can figure out what it makes potable water out of. <laughs> and then we brought up a new galley rack and then uh, output from the urine processor rack that goes into the galley rack. So together the, these suite of racks make up what we call the, the coffee machine because uh, it has the uncanny ability to take yesterday's coffee and make it into today's coffee. <laughs> and there's some assembly required, and as any uh, complex piece of equipment with serial number 001, uh, it takes a while to get it going. Uh, here we are with some of yesterday's coffee and some of today's coffee. Uh, and this is important technology when you go out into the solar system, because it's a, uh, nearly an anhydrous environment, and we're going to have to be able to take care of our water. And now on orbit, we also have paperwork to do, and here we are keeping track of all these items that we have to transfer. On November 18th, Stavice and Piper and Bowen were suited up and in the airlock ahead of schedule, ready to begin a historic spacewalk. The first one with a female lead spacewalker. During the spacewalk, Seta's tools got loose and floated away, but luckily for the pair, they had extra tools and were able to share. For me, it was kind of neat because I had to be on the end of the robotic arm, although most of the time I was holding this big blivet, so it kind of limited how much you could look around. Um, but then it was time to get out onto the Sarge. Um, I had an awful lot of work to do out there, and it was very tedious work. Um, it had to take off a cover, or it took off a series of covers, removed a trundle bearing, got uh, the grease guns out that we had to clean them up with and, and scrape off um, some, a lot of the debris. Because what had happened on the Sarge is the, um, the race ring where the bearing sits um, had a material failure and the bearing was also, it was, that bearing surface was actually coming apart, it was flaking. And, uh, and so that was bad because it was um, increasing the, the currents. And so um, we had this, this plan to go out there and take off every section of the race ring. And so it was something that obviously you're not gonna finish that in, uh, in one EVA. So uh, we did as much as we could on EVA one, and then the plan was on EVA two, we we're gonna go back out there and do some more work. But uh, before we did that, uh, we had to do some, some prep work for the next flight, um, getting ready for uh, 119. And uh, so we just uh, got on the, Shane got on the arm and we moved the seat of carts, um, just re relocated them from one side to the other so that they can get the MT all the way out on the starboard side. Uh, we also did some uh, repair work on the arm itself. Um, you know, it's amazing, all this equipment you know, has been up there you know, over, over 10 years, we've been bringing up a lot of equipment to space station. And just like anything in your house, your car, um, you know, you, you need to do maintenance on it. And um, a lot of this maintenance, you know, are things that we just never anticipated. Um, you know, very similar to, you know, Don says when you have a one of a kind, you know, serial number 001 on the arm, then, uh, you, you know, there's things come up in orbit that you just don't anticipate it. Um, I don't think they anticipated the, the snares on the end of the robotic arm. That's what they used to grasp something. And uh, there's, that's Shane's view of, you know, he's greasing them up and putting them back into the slots because uh, 
you know, they, they've managed to come out over the years. And uh, so, you know, lots of, lots of folks on the ground, um, you know, come up with our repair plans. We work together, um, training in the pool, trying to get things ready um, so that we can go out there and do, do the work that we need to do. Orbiting Space Travelers celebrated the 10th anniversary of the station with a spacewalk, where Stavice and Piper and Kimborough successfully achieved all tasks. On November 26th, the two crews prepare for the mission's third EVA, which was devoted to completing the cleaning, lubrication, removal, and replacement of the trundle-bearing assemblies in the starboard Sarge. Those are the rotating joints that allow the solar panels to adjust to the sunlight. The last spacewalk occurred on November 24th, totaling 6 hours and 27 minutes, bringing the total time spent in EVA activities for the mission to 26 hours and 41 minutes. And then when we, once we got back inside after that last EVA, you can see Shane dropped his pants real quick. He's ready to slide right out. And then shortly after that, Chris stood on my head and pushed me out because I didn't come out quite as easy as Shane does. One of the neat diversions we had on orbit was a couple of spiders and some caterpillars so that were busy trying to do what they normally do on Earth but couldn't figure out how to do it in space. Uh, but after a couple of days, a spider figured out how to make a, a symmetric web, and it was pretty neat. Uh, caught a few flies, and we're keeping track of that. Uh, Don is kind of famous for some neat science demos, and here's one where he's uh, put an Alka-Seltzer tablet in some water, and after six months without any soda, um, I was wondering if maybe this was, uh, you know, Diet Coke for the for the future in orbit. Here's a little demo uh, spinning something around its uh, its unstable axis, which is pretty neat. And if you thought you couldn't juggle in zero g, you can. The balls uh, don't come back, you just have to go after them. <laughs> so when we got to the space station, it's a very huge place, as you've heard mentioned, but it can also be a pretty high traffic area. So attached to node two here is what you're looking at. There's five elements attached, which is pretty amazing. So you'll see people coming out from different directions, and you'll see it looks like uh, DC traffic here in a minute. <laughs> A really spectacular place. You see Eric just look, working on some angular momentum, his figure, figure skating uh, talents there. And just these are just some living in space kind of shots that we wanted to share with you. It's me riding the bike. We all tried to exercise, you know, every day. It didn't happen all the time, but we tried to do that. Uh, we had a couple of good crew shots. This is our Thanksgiving dinner shot. So we all had Thanksgiving dinner on the shuttle mid-deck with the station crew as well. There's our delicious turkey and stuffing and... Uh, delightful meal that we had. You see Chris being a good astronaut playing with his food. I think he had some peanuts there. And Don, as, you, as you've already heard, is uh, quite, quite adventurous up there. He designed this coffee cup, he called it, uh, the Zero-G coffee cup, and he and Steve here are toasting, um, doing a few toasts to themselves, I'm sure. <coughs> So Eric here is putting a patch on, and what you're about to see is some great views out the uh, gem windows, which were spectacular um, windows that they had. Flight day 13 rolled around. It was time for us to close the hatches and uh, start <laughs> heading back to Earth. So we had to make sure we got everybody on the right side of the hatch, of course. And uh, then we undocked the next day, and I'll let Eric talk about the undocking phase. Endeavor undocked from the International Space Station on November 26, 2008. Okay, pedals clear. Both open. LHL, physical SEP, Houston. So this is one of the highlights of the mission. Another highlight that we had was to uh, undock. We undocked in the darkness, and then we time it so that at around the six to seven hundred point, we actually fly around the entire station, and then we come into sunlight just as we hit the six hundred foot point. And you can see how beautiful the station looks. And one of the things I want to point out is notice the arrays are parallel. 
And that shows all the work that we did on the starboard sarge, which is that single array that you see on the left side of the picture there. And as we uh, continued to fly around, got great views of the station. And one thing to note is the next flight that's coming up here, STS-119 in February, they're going to put on the final array that's going to go on the uh, outside here. So that mission's coming up shortly. One of the neat effects is, like we talked about earlier, is we get 16 sunrises and sunsets. Here you can see the, the sun is setting behind the uh, space station and the horizon just as we get ready to leave. And as we're leaving, we get again right back to work. We, we do another flight day inspection, and here's one of other, look on the left side of the picture here, you'll see a satellite get fired out that we also did. That was called PicoSat, and it has, it's up there right now investigating solar cell technology for the future. After two more days in orbit, and several delays due to weather. Endeavour performed the deorbit burn and landed at temporary runway 04 at Edwards Air Force Base, the only shuttle to do so. And you can see we're setting up to go to Edwards Air Force Base. And one of the highlights is coming back, seeing Edwards from 300 miles away uh, from the coast of California. We also landed at a runway that we hadn't gone to before, 04 left, which is an inside temporary runway, and you can see that there in the center of the picture. Yeah, it's always uh, interesting to come back to California. That was, that was my first venture, but uh, we land out there about once every year and a half uh, due to weather or other conditions in Florida, and it seems like uh, every time we, uh, we send this really impressive sonic boom over Los Angeles, uh, they forget the last time the shuttle flew over and did it. So there's uh, the interesting, the evening news is always interesting to watch after a shuttle landing. Um, as Eric had said, uh, this is a, um, a temporary runway. It's shorter and narrower, but it uh, works just great. Uh, the shuttle has actually only landed on a total of three different runways over the course of its entire lifetime, but it could land just about anywhere. Um, but uh, we had the opportunity to, to try this one out. I think it'll be the last time that uh, we ever actually land there. Um, it was a gorgeous day out there in California. Um, we're disappointed not to get out to Florida to see our uh, families who were eagerly waiting our uh, arrival. But uh, being a Sunday afternoon in military installation uh, in California, there's a lot less hands to shake. So uh, that's good or bad, depending upon uh, how you approach it. On November 26, 2008, Progress M01M was launched atop a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Site 15 at Baikonur Cosmodrome. It was the first flight of the Progress M11F61A60, which featured an upgraded digital flight computer and digital telemetry system, which replaced the earlier analog systems. Engine turbo pumps coming up to flight speed, engines at maximum thrust and lift off. Lift off of the ISS Progress cargo ship bound to the International Space Station. All first stage engines are up and running in good shape. All uh, parameters are nominal according to reports from the blockhouse at Baikonur. Following a four-day flight, Progress M01M docked with the Pierce module of the station on November 30th. Using the control moment gyroscopes of the U.S. segment. International Space Station crew commander Mike Fink and Magnus and Lonjikov will await the complete arrival at the International Space Station's Pierce docking compartment. It remained docked until February 6, 2009, when it undocked and spent two days in free flight before being deorbited and burning up in the atmosphere on February 8, 2008. For the next two days. On February 10, 2009, Progress M66 was launched atop a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Site 316 at the Bankanore Cosmodrome. This was the first time Site 31 had been used for a Progress launch since Progress M15 in 1992.
After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, Progress M66 docked with the Pierce module of the ISS on February 13, 2009. Required final approach now initiated. I have um, a little too bright of an image, um, so I'm going to adjust it a little bit. Okay, copy. Please do. You can see uh, the Pierce docking uh, compartment port segment along the longitudinal axis of the International Space Station uh, in the upper right-hand uh, quadrant of this view from the Progress camera. Uh, the Progress now 190 meters away from docking, closing at a rate of about two-tenths of a meter per second at the time of contact. The next shuttle mission would be STS-119 and deliver the final truss segment and the set of solar panels, giving the station its iconic four-panel silhouette.